Hey everybody, this is Mike. Welcome back to my shop and welcome back to my channel, Z Motorsports. Um, it's a uh, snowy Saturday here, uh, about a week before Christmas in northern Utah. This is uh, pretty much normal for this time of year, but we've had a great um, mild, we've had mild, nice mild weather leading up to this point well into December. So I guess I shouldn't complain, but uh, I'm not a fan of that white stuff falling out of the sky because that means I got to go shovel it after. But anyway, it's snowing pretty good here, so I'm uh, out in the shop finishing up some items that I uh, started on over this last week. So we're going to title this one uh, Shop Bits and Pieces Number 3. So I've just got a few little odds and ends that I kind of wanted to take a show you around what we've got going on here in the shop today. And this will probably be kind of a short video, but uh, we've got the Jeep on the lift. I pulled it in last night to do a lube oil filter service on it. It was due, so I figured if I'll do it now and it'll last me a few more months. So well in this probably later part of winter before I have to do it again. So just rotating the tires, um, changing the oil. Um, one thing that, I, that I'm uh, adding to it while we've got it here in the shop, when we went to um, Moab in October, it was the first trip with this uh, Dana 44, uh, e uh, excuse me, Pro Rock 44 axle housing. Um, I've never had this problem on any of the other Pro Rocks that I've built, but then again, they've always been, I've built them and handed them to the people and they put them underneath the Jeeps themselves. So this is the first one I've had under my own vehicle. And I've noticed that even with my limiting straps, that when I'm flexing out a lot, um, my spring, my coil springs on the front are just kind of snapping and popping in and out of the helical groove that's cut in the top of those uh, Pro Rock um, housings there. So on the factory, on the OEM axles, it's a stamped steel and the edges are rolled nice and easy. So even if the springs are moving around, they don't seem to make any audible noise per se. And I've never had enough play in them to where they'll, the spring will pop out because I've got the limiting straps on it. But there's just enough to where on this Pro Rock housing, that these springs are popping in and out of that, that more uh, crisp or, defi or definitive edge, if you will, where the uh, springs sit down in on those helical cuts. So while I've got the Jeep on the lift, I'm actually, I just took and made a couple of really simple um, spring retainers. So I pulled the uh, bump stops off the bottom and these will, these will go in and reside underneath them and just pinch down. I put a couple of real mild bends in them so as you tighten it down, kind of preloads down, holds the springs, the lower, the lower, the, the very bottom spring wrap, it'll hold it down into those helical cut grooves. So um, it, it was what kind of embarrassing when I'd be flexing out on this last deep run we went on you know, down to Moab, I'd be flexing out and I'd hear that pop and boing sound and that's what, it was those springs snapping in and out of those grooves. So uh, it bugged the hell out of me. So we're gonna remedy that. Um, and then while I've, uh, I've also got a buddy, I'm not, I haven't worked on snowmobiles for quite a while. We kind of got out of, we snowmobiled really heavily as a family from 89 when the wife and I got married through, clear through 2009 <coughs> when we uh, decided to go a different direction with our recreational activities. So we sold, we, for 20 years there, we snowmobiled very heavily. I built a lot of Polaris and Arctic Cat snowmobiles, did some Skidoo, a little bit of work for, on the Bombardier engines on stuff for, for Skidoo uh, friends, but we really enjoyed it. It was a big part of our life, but I kind of got out of working on sleds, um, sold my carts, my dollies, all that, all my spare parts and everything, and uh, kept my tools, obviously, my specialty tools for them, but anyway, a buddy of mine's got an all, uh, mid 90s Polaris Ultra 680 triple that he uses to go in and out of his cabin and so forth up in the Uinas, and he just sat for a couple years, hasn't run, so I told him to bring it over, I'd take a look at it for him and get it going. I'm sure it's probably carburation and looks like the choke lever's broken, which is common on those. So I haven't worked on sleds in a long time for, what, nine, almost nine, eight, eight years now. So uh, I'll work 
working on a snowmobile. After I get the Jeep done, I'll probably tear into the carbs on that and get them, get that up and running for him so he can come and get it. So I think they're planning on trying to take the family up to the cabin next week for uh, Christmas. So I'd kind of like to get it done for him so we could have, have an extra sled to get people in and out of their cabin. So um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and put these spring uh, retainers into the Jeep and put the tires back on and torque everything on in the Jeep, put the food, put, uh, oil in it, and the Jeep's pretty much done, then I'll move on over to the sled. All right, so there's my little retainer. And it, like I said, it just resides down underneath there. <clears throat> Nothing elaborate, but it'll do the trick. Try to keep it turned as much as possible so it kind of puts pressure and preloads onto the uh, um, that first wrap on the coil on the coil. Okay. Okay, one installed. Now I'll, uh, looks like it's making contact there, so I'll go over and do the other side. So the Jeep's all done. Um, the, uh, it's sitting back down on the ground, got the tires and wheels put back on, all torqued on, oil's changed, spring retainers are done, so. Sad state, the old girl's pretty filthy. I was gonna wash it yesterday after work before I pulled it in here last night, but then this looming storm that was supposed to come through today, I figured I'd just wash it after the storm. So anyway, it's, uh, I apologize for how filthy it is. It usually isn't this dirty. So Jeep's done. Um, let me walk over here. Sorry about going handheld here. And there's the uh, Polaris Ultra. I just had to drop it on the trailer because I didn't want to scratch my floor up, um, dragging sleds around. And that's my last shop. There's a lot of marks and stuff in the in the floor. It wasn't the end of the world. It was a working shop. Um, but as soon as I don't work on sleds anymore, I asked him if he would mind just dropping the trailer and let me just work on the trailer so I don't have to scratch my floor up. Granted, the floor is going to get scratched. It's going to get dinged. It's gonna get oil stains, it's just a fact of life, but if I can prolong it as long as possible, I'd like to. So, actually, the sled's not too bad a shape. Um, it has an XLT hood on it, which is, they either come in a 580 or a 600, but it's actually an Ultra 680 triple. Um, the uh, guy he bought this sled from had wrecked it and just put an XLT hood on it, but it is an Ultra. I like say the suspension's in good shape. Trailing arms was one of the first things that these things used to get uh, beat up on so it's actually in pretty good shape so I will uh, get working on that uh, here momentarily I think it stopped snowing outside so I think I'm going to walk outside and shovel off the uh, areas that are in the shade at least and hopefully the sun looks like it wants to pop out so it can uh, melt off with cam. So real quick, I got a couple little projects here I threw together the other night um, that uh, kind of thought was kind of cool. Uh, third, welders third hand, um, this works great for, and I, I know anybody who's been welding these, they know what these are. You put them on to hold pieces when you're welding them, packing them, so forth. Um, I went one step further on this one. <clears throat> I took uh, Jody over at Welding Tips and Tricks lead, and I put silicon bronze on the feet and up here at the the, the tip um, because a lot of times if I'm welding a part that I don't want to clamp the ground to or I don't want any arc marks I will actually just go ahead and put that on there and use this as the, uh, the to make sure I've got a good ground on it um, what this is is this is actually out of a Cummins N N14 diesel engine this is the wrist pin so I had this kicking around for a while from an old 
from a project I did many, many years ago. I kept a couple of these that worked great for pre for pressing things over the hydraulic press, and I had one more. So I thought, ah, heck, I'll go ahead and use this to make a welder's helper with. Um, I've had a couple other ones that I had a little square block on. One had a little more of a point on it for holding small pieces, but I wanted, uh, I've had them forever. I've wanted to make something a little bit nicer. And in this little project, um, I can't take credit for this. This was, I believe his name is Douglas over at Retro Weld. Uh, I was watching some videos the other day and he did this uh, to, to, for a uh, TIG torch holder. And I thought that was a pretty ingenious idea. And I had a piston and rod assembly out of a, our old, one of our old sand uh, drag quads. It was uh, powered by a GS1100, Suzuki GS1100. So I went ahead and dug it out, seeing as how we don't have the uh, quad any longer. And uh, go ahead and went ahead and built a... TIG torch holder. I had this one for many years and it worked great. Um, just got a magnetic base on it. It worked really great, but I want. I, I saw that one that uh, I said. I believe his name is Douglas. I apologize for that. It's not, but um, over at Retro Weld, and it's just a piston. Um, went ahead and drilled and tapped the crown to accept a magnet, and then drilled and tapped for a quarter twenty set screw going in right here off of the boss for the wrist pin. Then bent the rod at ninety, cut the, the rod cap, and turned each half upwards and works great for a TIG rod, TIG torch holder. So just a little cooler looking, it does the same thing, but just a little cooler looking than this one. And so I thought I would uh, go ahead and knock the, these two little projects out the other day, which I did. So I thought, it seems how this is a bits and pieces video, I figured I'd go ahead and throw those up there and show you. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and move over and work on this uh, Plara Snowball. <clears throat> so I got the uh, carburetors off. Got the mag side, center, and the PTO side. Um, so got them off. The uh, choke on the PTO side was stuck in there pretty good. Um, every one of them, or well, the PTO and the mag side, when I pulled the slides out, the, they were just covered with the green slime and that smell of fuel and two-stroke oil just never seems to go away. You know, you, you catch one whiff of that and you remember, even though you hadn't messed with them much in a couple of years, that that just smell is memorable. So, however, the center one, obviously he had other issues because the slide wasn't even connected to the uh, pull cable. So I pulled the top cap, top cap off, the spring was laying in there. So I played with it a little bit and I was able to coax the slide out. But you can see how it's just covered in that green slime. So I'm gonna go ahead and disassemble these soak them in carburetor cleaner and then check you want things you want to check for especially are the jets pilot jet in particular because the pilot circuit obviously is smaller so they're usually the first ones to plug up so and then your your, your air bleeds you want to make sure and check those out good so i'm going to go ahead and disassemble one and then i've got this wall bro kit that i've had for shit 30 30 years now i've replaced the, the line on it a couple of times um this is the one that's for like a lot of small engines and stuff, has a little slide hammer um, for pulling the uh, seats out of some of the Tecumseh and uh, Briggs carbs, as well as the Walbro. Um, so I've got a little pressure gauge here. I'll, I'll show how to disassemble them, and then I'll clean them. You don't, probably don't need to see me soak them in cleaner or anything. And then when it comes back to reassembling them, I'll come back and show you. And then I like to, sh I'll show you how I set the pressures for the uh, needle and seat. I usually like to have them hold about five to six pounds of pressure uh, with the arms, the fulcrum arms parallel with the base of the carb. So um, let's go ahead and start disassembling them. Let's just pick one here. Let's just start on the outside. Let's just pick, start with the, uh, which one's this here? This is the PTO side. We'll just start with this one then. So disassemble, you'll pull the float bowl off. Actually, while well, it's still got, well, it's a little easier to hold on to, I'm going to pop that bottom cap off. Those should be a 17 millimeter if memory serves. Yep, 17, 17 millimeter. Pull that bottom cap off. When you're changing jets out in the food, whoa, look at all that green gunk in there. 
when you're up on the hill changing um, jets, I usually I, I didn't run air boxes. I usually had air filter, like Canans or the Unifilters or the big ass um, uh, air filters. The kick ass, sorry, kick ass air filters. Those are the ones I usually run. Um, anyway, pop this bottom cap off, and then I had a little aluminum jet tool there. You reach right up underneath, pop your main jet out, and change jets. Um, right there in the field, we, <laughs> I can't tell you how many, probably thousands of times we change jets up on the mountain. Sometimes half a dozen, six, eight times a day when you're dialing, dialing in a new motor or getting ready for a, uh, an event, whether it be hill climbing or um, drags. So trying to get right, trying to get them to run right on that ragged edge. So um, you try to make it as easy as possible. That's why air boxes were uh, a little harder, a little more cumbersome. So. Um, like I said, just usually pop the uh, air boxes off and put unifilters as one of the bigger ones. They're one of the majority of the ones I run. And then uh, pop those a little bit and make sure that, that helps to break the gasket loose. Actually, the inside of that bowl doesn't look as bad as I was anticipating. I figured it'd be eighth inch deep of slime, but it's just barely got a green tint there. So, needle's stuck, needle's not moving, which I kind of half expected that. So I'm gonna pull these vent lines off because you don't want to put those into the carburetor cleaner. Maybe I'll pull them off, they're stuck on there pretty good. them and they usually pop right loose. Okay, that line's out of the way. Now I'll come over here and pull the uh, main, ooh boy, it's got so much crap on it, the tool won't even hardly fit onto the main jet. Oh, nasty. And I bet you that jet's plugged. No, believe it or not, well, it's restricted. You can see restriction in it, but it, it's not plugged. I'm going to go out and limit, see the pilot one is, though. Now the um, needle jet is the tube, and it'll usually press. There we go. Drops right out. Yeah, look at all that green slime. And you, ah, just, yeah, that is nasty. That is just, crap's just sticking in the, in the air bleeds and everything on that, so. Yeah, she's, uh, she's in dire need of needing to be clean, that's for certain. I don't know how long this is sat. He told me a couple of years. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was longer than a couple of years. It's pretty, pretty gummed up. Sometimes this hinge pin, fulcrum pin for the float arms, uh, sometimes they'll push right out and they're just centered in there by the recess in the cup, or in the, excuse me, in the bowl, so it sits over it so it can't come out. This one here obviously is an interference fit. What these will have is on the very outside, so once you get a moving, on the very outside there'll be a fine set of knurls that locks it in there, that last little tiny bit. You'll need about a sixteenth inch punch to uh, drive those out. There we go. And so you see how easy it comes out. It's just this very outer edge is a thousandth or two larger diameter or sometimes you'll see real faint knurls out there so it kind of locks it in. Okay. And yeah, it should be a ten millimeter, or excuse me, eight. Eight millimeter, I believe. Nine. There we go. So we'll pull the needle and seat out. There's a gasket on either side of that splash shield. Okay. Let's pull the. Uh, 
pilot jet in here. Because all you're doing is stripping those um, jets out. Whoa, yeah, that's plugged. That's nasty. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, break the other ones down and soak them. But that's basically how these come apart. Pretty, pretty quick, pretty simple. Um, like I say, these are just a typical round slide Makuni. Um, Kian's very, very uh, similar. Almost All right, so here's another common problem that these uh, used to have is the choke lever on these chokes would break off. You can see that the levers broke off half the um, the boss that the pin went through. So this was pretty common of a failure on these. And luckily, I used to stock these uh, kits, and they have either doubles or triples, but whether you have three choke cables or two choke cables, so twin cylinder or three uh, uh, triple cylinder. Uh, anyway, I dug through my stuff. I thought I remembered having a couple of these left over when we was moving from the old shop to this one and setting everything up. So sure enough, I walked over to my uh, drawers that I keep my uh, small miscellaneous parts in, and sure enough, I had one. So. I will uh, go ahead and replace it so you, the case, case comes off, pull the spring out, comes with a new spring. So you just kind of have to get a screwdriver underneath and slip that out. Then they're pretty simple to do. They're easier to just pull off the sled to do. There's just one big plastic nut and they come right off. So they come with a roll pin, the choke lever, the new boss, and then you see where this one is not broken. It's, it's real thin plastic on either side of that hole, so you can see how easily they break. So let's uh, go ahead one by one and put these... Uh, Cables in. There's a little, uh, a little cut with, a, with these little lead lead ends. Of these cables slip down into. They're pretty. They go on pretty simply. They just, uh, like I said, there's three notches. The cables slip down in, and then once they go back into the body, they really can't fall out. Take just a little, I usually take a little bit of grease, and I'm just gonna use a little bit of lithium grease and put in around the uh, block so it slides in and out nice and smooth. Oops, just knocked it off the cable there. spring over the boss and slide this through. It snaps back into place. Then you've got your lever. back on. You just put this over, put the roll pin in. And I also use a little bit longer roll pin because these roll pins they give you are barely, barely wide enough to span that. And if you f pull up and flip it, a lot of times those would spread just enough that the snap ring to pop out. Or not snap ring, the roll pin. 
So I just usually use a little bit longer one. I believe this one's like three eighths of an inch. Yeah, and I usually use a half inch one. So it sticks out about a sixteenth on either side. So I'll go ahead and grab one of those, put that back in, go over and put this back on the sled while uh, the carburetors are still soaking in. Carburetor cleaner. Okay, we got the parts cleaner, or the carburetor cleaner. I've got everything, kind of all the parts blown off and whatnot. So we're gonna start assembling them. We'll start here with the uh, PTO side. So start off with, we'll put the, uh, um, go ahead and put the needle and seat down into place. Make sure when you're cleaning these, make sure you blow all your passages out because those uh, have a tendency to um, get plugged up as well as the jets. Okay. Drop the jet in. Slide the or excuse me the needle jet. Needle jet can only go in one way, and it's the because it's got a, uh, a cutaway in it. But think of it this way: is the, the cutaway on the on the needle jet has to face the engine because as the air is going in, it's going to go around it and create a venturi effect and pull that. So that's just rather than sticking it down in there and having to turn it, turn it. Just better off to know why things work, how they work rather than just dumb luck of dropping things together until they fit. So, and you can kind of usually just kind of reach in through the inlet and, the, and the, the engine side and the air filter side and kind of work it into the hole and push it in. And then usually these will, this one, eh, this one's not too bad. Sometimes if you tip them up, they'll fall through. So I just got in the habit of putting my finger up underneath there and holding it in. Put your top cap on. Then your main jet. Tighten the main jet in. Okay. Now put your uh, fulcrum on for your uh, fuel level. And then we'll set the fuel level. Okay. Now. I usually shoot for about 6 PSI, so go ahead and hold it in inverted, pump it up. And what you, what you usually want is you want those those uh, arms that the floats right up and down on. I like to have them parallel on this style of carburetor. I like to have them parallel with the um, base or with the body. So I'll hold it parallel, pump it up, and you can see the gauge. It's going in there, so it's probably could be tweaked just a little bit. Now to adjust the fuel level, there's a little tab right there. Rather than pushing and tugging and pulling on the arms that you're pushing down on the on the needle for the needle and seat, just take a small little screwdriver and stick underneath. And just give it a little tweak. There we go. Nice and level. Now let's double check. Boom, it's holding pressure about five to six, and then we'll see what it pops off. Pops at about seven. So it just goes past, and you can see the needle, and it'll go. There's 10, here's just, here's 10. The needle's sitting right now at about three, so let's go ahead and, so there's about six, it's holding that, and it goes to about seven and pops. Okay. So that's how, that's how I always set these up. Then you can go ahead and put your bowl. Now, like I said, this this here style or this this particular carburetor 
the pin for the fulcrum is a little bit larger at the uh, just under the head, so you have to tap it in. Some of these do not; they just have a floating pin, and this little boss right here that's cast into the bowl is what holds it in there. So when you're that's the only reason why I mention that is if you're tipping these carburetors around, just be careful if that's the style it has because that pin can fall out and you'll end up punching for it. So this side, this style, they usually saw me. It, I had to tap it in. So go ahead and slide your bowl down on over. Go ahead and start your screws for the bowl. I usually go down and just snug it and then zigzag across to the other side. Snug it. Snug it. And lastly, snug that one down and then tighten down a little bit more. It's just aluminum body. You don't need to grunt down on them. Strip them out. Then go ahead. Ah. I forgot to clean that out. So then go ahead and put your uh, caps on your bowls and your vent lines. Vent lines, this, the vent line goes back to the um, air box where it hooks onto it. So I'll just stick them on here where it's nice and easy to do it here rather than fighting with it on the sled. Okay, so that carburetor's done. I'm gonna clean out these, uh, clean these mains out, these uh, caps off, and then uh, finish up the other ones. So I'm not gonna bore you with doing the other three, but I do, I'll do them all that same way. And then once I'm down, once I've got it down on the machine and running, Got a quick, simple little tool here that I made years ago that works well for adjusting these because it is down in there a ways. If I can just find said tool. Okay, then once I get the car, once I get the um, carburetors down into place, the the adjustment screws for the idle are right here. Now remember these ones. If it's on the if it's on the air filter side of the slide, it's going to control air. So turning it in is restricting the air. It's going to rich in the mixture. It's just the opposite of what you'd think. If the if the idle mixture screws are over here on the engine side of the slides, they usually control fuel or emulsified fuel, more particular. But these ones are on the air on the air horn side, so they're going to control air. So once they're down on the engine, mounted in there, and you fire up and get it running, I took and made this little tool. It's just a piece of welding rod that I bent the end around for a hook, and at the end I just took and hammered it down and flattened it on the anvil and the vise, and ground it to a little screwdriver so you can aim it down, because it's hard to find a screwdriver that thin and that long, but sometimes somewhat flexible, you can curve around a, an air horn or something to get to. This works great. Uh, just, and it's just like I said, I made that probably 30 years ago and I've been using it ever since. I, I used to keep one slid down alongside my seat on my, on my Polaris and then the snap, I undid the snap and the snap went through here and held it into place. So if I get up on the hill, I could undo that snap, slide it out and I could fine tune my idle mixture right there on the mountain real slick and simple. So um, a lot of my buddies just give me a hard time because we'd get up there stop for lunch or a soda or something and I was over there fine tuning my uh, carburation on mine because you know you change altitudes on those things and it can it does affect the way they run and usually you usually when I set them up for customers I'd set them up as a happy medium but I always like mine running kind of right on the ragged edge so um, I was always adjusting it.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and knock the other two out, and then we'll put them on the sled and fire the Okay, so up. we got to this point here. Um, it's all up and running. I've got it fine-tuned. I went through and used my cool little tool to get all the idle mixture set on each one. So that part's done. And one last thing I like to check, and I've already checked this, but I'm going to do it on camera just so you see. This is a flow gauge. This is made by uh, Synchrometer um, Redline. So what I do on these is I go through and I set on, on the air horn of each carburetor, make sure that each one is contributing the same. If they're not contributing the same, you can have a flat spot, off, um, off idle hesitation. There's multiple things that can take place. So I like to have them all contributing the same at idle, and then just when you crack the throttle, they should all respond the same and a lot of times you can set that but just by your free play in each of your cables so let's go ahead and fire it fire it up here same so now I'll just go ahead and put the air box back on and this is a two-piece air box the bottom piece goes in first goes over the air horns the vent lines hook up and then the top piece fits down over it so we go ahead and finish that up and then this uh, job's done I can call my buddy and come and pick it up that looks like that concludes uh, shop bits and pieces number three so it wasn't anything really major it's kind of a short video um, I just had some projects going on today Saturday and I figured I'd hurry and throw a little video together um, throw it up on the channel so uh, I appreciate all the appreciate taking the time to, to watch got a lot of new subscribers so I appreciate that and uh, if there's something you like um, that you want to see more of please let me know in the comments and I can try to fit it into a video um, I appreciate you taking the time to watch and uh, Wife just stuck her nose in, and she's home from uh, her her gallivanting around this afternoon, and she stuck her nose in. Let me know that it's snowing. So, looks like we're gonna pretty much take, uh, pick up where we left off this morning with having to go out and shovel snow. So, uh, thank you, thank you again for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.